So again, most websites have some kind of input device, right, or input field if you're going to specialize in that. Sometimes you could just blow it off and be a guest, though, right? That's usually a good option to be a guest. The downfall of being a guest is you don't know if it's a robot or a person. So how do you get away from, you know, if you are a web designer and you're making a website, how do you know if it's a computer or if it's a person, right? Very good. So here we got the caption reading right there. So uh, you know it's it's kind of an old old school way of doing it, um, and uh, you know because today the, the, it's evolving. You know Google has the recaptcha right, which basically since Google knows everything about you, it can tell if you're a person or a robot. And don't be fooled. Your website, if you if you've ever had a website and you you look at the server logs. Your server is being bombarded by robots constantly, you know, constantly. All you have to do is look at your server log. There's all kinds of robots, bots all around the internet. The bot is basically a program that's going around and reading your content and hitting your website constantly all around the world. And uh, you can just look at the server logs and hit awesome. So, one way again to make sure if people is the recaptcha or captcha. And uh, a program or system intended to dis distinguish humans from machine input, typically as a way of storing spam and automated extraction of data from websites. And of course, Google has offers the captcha, you can put it on your website. Here's a typical old school way, right? We had to type in the characters. Well, okay, what was the problem with this though? Hard to see the characters. And the, the bots got smart enough that they were able to read that anyway. You know, bots are smart. People are smart. They can always round that. Uh, of course, if you can't see though, as far as accessibility, what happens? Well, I can't see that. So it has, they have to have an audio. Again, you can get a free capture for your website. A lot of uh, of of a lot of um, data server companies will will give you the capture. Like, let's say you wanted people to sign up. You're trying to get an email from people, right? You want to get an email from people. Uh, uh, where do you get an email? Mailchimp or one of those email companies. They specialize in making email lists for your company. They'll offer you, you know, a box that you can put in there and then a capture to go along with that box as well on your website. Uh, what was it? What's another one? MailChimp and what else? What's the most popular one? Constant Contact. That's the one, right? If you've never heard of Constant Contact, that's a good, what is it? Constant Constant contact. Again, MailChimp, constant contact, uh, Monday. Uh, so, again, constant contact. You can sign up with their service. You can take their input and put it on your website. And you get people that sign up to be on your mailing list. The nice thing about constant contact is that you can build um, HTML emails. So you can make a nice looking email that has you know, images in it and things like that. But you have to use your template. That's one of the downfalls of using these services is that you can make a nice email list then you can make a nice email with images and HTML in it and all that stuff, but you have to use kind of a template. I've tried to get around the template, and it 
coding. So you can go in there and code your own stuff and link from images that are online and stuff like that, but it's, you know, their template is it's kind of the easiest way to do that. Have you seen emails with images and things like that in it, right? If you've ever signed up for something and you get your Macy's? I think my wife probably does. She does this stuff. The Macy's special, right? You get your coupons. Oh, what's the one? Michael's. Michael's sent about that, yeah. So, again, that's a very common way of people inputting data. So, you know, of course, I have one. It's not very good. Where is it? No, it's not even here. Oh, here, sign up now. Look, it's all the way down here. But it's a form, and notice how it says email and sign up. That's all it's asking you for, email and sign up, okay? By entering your email, you consent to receiving Zircon messages you may later unsubscribe. And then, of course, you all know about the new California law, right? Starting January 1st. The new California law. Hey, let's read about that. You should know about that. Let me get to my email. It's in there. Oh, look. See, what do you think of the Yahoo sign up? It's always is a box. It, it's not a square, is it? It's just a word that says email address, but it has the blue line that helps you put it there. And then you got this big next right here, right? Do you remember when they went to two, two, two page login? Do you remember that? Remember in the days when Yahoo, you had your email, you had your email and your password on the same page. Now they have email and they're next. Why did they go to two pages? Security, yes. That's likely to keep from getting blocked. So let's uh, let me log in here if I can remember my password with uh, crazy characters and uh, oh there's a new filter bubble video too I'm gonna buy a new laptop but what am I looking for what did I just say we're looking for a new California law right there it is Microsoft vows to honor California sweeping privacy law across the entire US what does that mean what is this California law so the CCPA, which was approved in June 2018, was a sweeping privacy regulation in the U.S., somewhat similar to the GDPR, right? You, you remember the, the European Union went to the privacy law back, was it May of uh, 2018? Right? You remember that? That's why you see all the websites today now have, you know, the message we're collecting your data, blah blah blah, right? Because they have to, they have to disclose that, right? So most websites today will have that kind of disclosure, and with California passing a law, all websites are going to be like that, right? So if you go here, if I, I just go to, all right, let's go to, uh, I have to use a different browser, again, even go to my website. You see it at the top. See, this website uses cookies to improve your experience. Read about a privacy policy. Uh, the European Union, you know, passed that law and went in May, I believe, of 2000. It might have been 2017, or was it 2018? You remember that law? No. You have to disclose that you're collecting the data on the website, and you have to disclose what type of data you're disclosing that you're collecting, and you have to give them the ability to opt out. That was the European law. Now California passed a very similar law, and it's gonna go into effect January 1st. So it's gonna affect everything that people do online, right? And of course, people are gonna try and get around it. But that's why we have that up there at the top. Uh, 
um, because we sell products in Europe and South America and Brazil now. It's Brazil. We have products in Brazil. Portuguese. Very difficult. Spanish is easier than Portuguese. Okay. Uh, so, um, be aware there is a new law that you, especially if you're going to make websites, you should be aware of that. And uh, I can link this up for you if you want to see it. Um, California just passed one of the toughest data privacy laws in the country. The California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018 is set to dramatically change how businesses handle data in the most prosperous state. Companies that store large amounts of personal information, including major players like Google and Facebook, are required to disclose the type of data they collect, as well as allow consumers to opt out of having their data sold. The bill, which passed both cha chambers anonymously, anonymously, was signed later in the day by Governor Brown. Uh-oh. The legislation, which is similar to Europeans' GDP protection, is a last-minute attempt to head off ballot measures that would have brought a slightly different set of privacy rules. Whatever. You get the idea. You should probably read it or know what, it, what the requirements are, especially if you're going to make a website. I am just pointing it out to you because it's something you should know. Okay, let's get back to ca CAPTCHA. Um... Where is my, uh, let's close that, and let's close that, constant contact. Uh, again, you can actually get the Google CAPTCHA, okay, if you want. Um, they do have a, an option for it where you can sign up and then put it on your website. Oh, there's that version 3. If you have a website, you need to protect your users from bots. Bots are trying leaked passwords, posting spam, and scraping your content. The reCAPTCHA I'm Not a Robot checkbox changed the way to protect your websites, but its one time verification doesn't fit every use case. reCAPTCHA v3 does away with the need for interactive tests and gives you a score to let you know when you have risky traffic. It never interrupts users, so you're in control of when to run risk analysis and what to do with the results. For instance, requiring email verification for risky logins, sending a spammy post to moderation, or filtering fake friend requests. Let's look at how reCAPTCHA v3 works. This is my online store. I've recently noticed a lot more traffic that wasn't turning into conversions. I was concerned that they might not be real customers, but I didn't know where they were on my site or what they were trying to do. To tackle this problem, I decided to add reCAPTCHA v3 to each major part of my site, such as when users sign in, check out, and write product reviews. For each page, I added the reCAPTCHA script tag and code snippet. Doing this gave me visibility into what the bots were doing on my site. I went to the reCAPTCHA admin console to look at the scores. It seems that these bots were posting lots of reviews. To stop the bots, I needed to verify the reCAPTCHA score on my server. Here was a bot posting a review for a competitor's cat food. Because this review received a low reCAPTCHA score, I marked it as risky and added it to a verification queue. Now the bots have been turned away and my customers can trust the reviews that they see. So how does this work? reCAPTCHA's adaptive risk analysis engine takes in various signals about the interaction and predicts the likelihood that the request was generated by a bot. It works best with context about how both humans and bots interact with your website. So for best performance, include reCAPTCHA in many places. With reCAPTCHA v3, you can keep your site safe without any user friction and get more control to stop attacks in your own way. So everyone stays happy, except bots. So again, you know, the CAPTCHA, reCAPTCHA is a, a kind of an important part of trying to keep bots and other non, we'll say, people reviews. Um, so there you go. Uh, where's my form? So here's some videos on form design. I don't think, I don't know if we have to go through all that right now. Um, but, you know, you should know the basic 
uh, box boxes that you could use. Um, what is a hidden bo box as well? Uh, there's some reading. Or there's some reading on form design. This is kind of old, 2008, but again, forms are still the same as you know. I don't know. Whoosh! Remember when it used to look like that? Wow. 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 Imagine that. Here's one from 2011. Oh, they wanted it to be interesting look. I don't like that. I like simple. Um, so, this probably had some good videos, like this one right here about the password one. So probably I would, you know, like you to sort of maybe include a, like a login or some kind of form in your uh, final project. It would be great to have you think about how people log in. It's really good exercise to go through. You, everybody goes through and logs in. I, I put some common ones that we use. Of course, we love our Canvas login, don't we? You're used to that one. What about the Canvas one? What do you think about it? Simple. Does it tell you what, what kind of password to make? I think it's just the birthday. The birthday, yeah. Mm -hmm. But do you have to put in a crazy character, eight characters and that? I don't remember. It's just a regular Is it like December? But, you know, it's kind of simple. One thing I like, of course, about this form is that it's blue around the first box you should be using, right? It has a little eye bar in there, but it doesn't say anything in there, does it? It says up here, always ID, right? Password is password. Of course, it puts the dots in there. Stay signed in is usually an option that you have in a form design. And then, of course, you got your forgot password and then log in. And sometimes it says submit. What's another one? Got it. Uh, again, very simpler signs. Nice balance. Uh, if you make a form in HTML, of course, remember you need to put in max characters, right? Let's put in the common. Common. Uh oh. We're gonna write it on the board. Write it on the board. Whoosh, what is this? What is this? Who's in the HTML class? Just one of you. Alright. You need to do your forms. Now, the most common form options. Common form options. Good. Let me get a blue one here. Of course, the uh, input box is the most common one. Right? Okay. Input. Input. Input box. Uh, some characteristics of the input box is that it's measured in characters, not pixels. So the size of the box is measured in how many characters, at least in HTML. You can go back and change the size of your box in CSS, but if you make a straight box in HTML, it's usually measured in characters. The other thing you should do is you should give it max characters or max characters. What is max characters? It limits the amount of characters somebody can put in a box. I already told you that story, didn't I, of 1997? Right? The Yahoo, exactly. Remember, 1997, Yahoo came down. Uh, we did input box, and then, of course, password box. Put the dots in there, right? Then, of course, a box with the arrow like this. It's called a select box. Select. And then what is another box? Then we have, of course, the square boxes. Checkbox. Okay, and what, what, when we use a checkbox, why, why do we use a checkbox over the other one, like the radio box? Remember the round one? 
radiant. But why would I use this one over this one? Or this one over that one? The difference between the radio and the check box. Visibility, maybe, but that's not quite the right, right answer there, but I like your attitude thinking about it. Okay, let's say you want to, you, you're asking somebody, what is your favorite types of food? And they kind of like, you know, and you have a list of you know, meat, chicken, whatever, I don't know. And the user can then put in several options. Let's use the checkbox. And you're asking the user for one option, the radio buttons, box, button. The radio is only one choice. The checkbox is going to be multiple choices. That's a bit more important. So these are most common. Of course, you got your submit and your reset. There's no reset here, is there? That was very common back in the old days, reset, right? <laughs> There's no reset. I haven't seen reset in a long time. How about this one? What's the problem with this one? Kind of same color as the background, right? One thing that's nice about having a, um, a, a input or form is that it kind of differentiates between the content that surround it. So I, I kind of like to use color. I like the way the blue was around the login and canvas, right? Then, of course, we have the simple Yahoo one with the blue. We already talked about using the, uh, what is that, magnifying glass, right? Did we draw one? I think we made one. Didn't we make a search box? Very common. Again, I put bar in there. What do you think of uh, this one where you have... Um, where is it? The icons. There was one I had with icons somewhere. Is it this one? No. Maybe this one. Yeah, see how this one has icons? You got your user with the little little character guy right there, user, and then a password and a pillbox, right? These are, the term for this is called a pillbox, right? Because it's in the shape of a pill. And then, of course, square ones are very common. Username and password inside the box instead of outside. Um, nothing... It's very painful if you, you ask the user to delete the text that's in there before they have to type it in, so don't have them do that. I don't mind the, the text being in the box. Um, do you really think you need the icon with the word? What do you think? It's probably not. I don't know, I guess it's eye candy. Quicker to see it maybe, that you can visually, oh, there's, yeah, than, than having to read maybe. International people that English isn't their first language. Most people know, even if it's a foreign language, what username is and password, right? What do you think? In, in Farsi, what do people know? In Iran, what username and password is, right? You know, so, you know, even if their English isn't their first language, pretty much everybody knows computer language. Yeah, so. What do you think, Toby? Everybody knows computer language? Maybe not. Depends. Where are you yeah. India, right? Yeah. Okay, there's, there's how many different languages in India? Many. Yeah. There's like so many, hundreds of languages in India. But they don't know what username and password is pretty much, right? So, yeah. Gotta love Google Translate, right? 
So I don't know. There's there's some links here to uh, login screens that I, I think I posted these on on Canvas, and so there's a variety of different login screens that you could use and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on. So you know, think about you know form design. Uh, this one's like five minutes long. Hey marketers, I'm Green Akitani here at Wishpon, and I'm going to teach you seven best practices for web form design. Are you getting the conversion rates you want from the forms on your website? Nope. Creating a great web form is easy. You just need to know how. So I'm going to teach you seven key principles that can help improve your conversion rates. By learning how to design a great web form, you can get the most out of your traffic. So, a form is the main way that you generate and learn about your leads. It's where your page goes from purely informational to a business tool. Optimizing your form's design will encourage people to actually complete your form. So let's start with number one. Use directional cues to guide your visitors to your form. Directional cues are signals to tell someone to complete an action. You can guide visitors to your form by using directional cues such as photos, videos, shapes, or text. And here's a tip. Use an image of a person looking at your form. Humans are social creatures, so we tend to be drawn to what others are looking at. And you can use this human trait to direct visitors to your form. So for example, you can have a person looking at your form with their eyes or their head, pointing to your form with their hands or their body. Really? Holding your form. Really? Or use arrows. Our whole lives have been driven by shapes and symbols directing us where to go. Okay, I don't have to sit through this, but you get the idea. There's a video there. Okay, let's get back to uh, what's on Canvas. So again, you can consider adding a form to your final project. I did start typing up an idea for what you should include in your final project here. Uh, the other one that I have linked here for this week again was gesture. We already kind of talked about the different types of gesture um, um, and so on. And there's more information about material design here. I don't know. We could have a whole, whole class on material design. And then of course Apple has their own guidelines as well. And, uh, you know, some of the things I don't like about the Apple one is the uh, uh, the 3D touch, you know, because you're, like, touching things on your, 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 your phone, and all of a sudden it, it pops up and says, oh, you want to you wanna save this or something. You're just like, no, I didn't want to save it. I was just scrolling, right? So, I don't know. It's painful. So, final project plan. I was typing something up, and I, I'm going to change it a little bit. But let's see what I wrote. This was Saturday, and I don't remember what I wrote on Saturday. Saturday was a long, long, long time away. I was typing this Saturday, and I don't remember. Okay, here we go. Last day of class is Thursday, December 12th at 9.40. So don't pass on that Tuesday that week. Finals week. All right? I want you to have a proposal. Like you see the samples, and again, we don't have a lot of time. That's like one month from now, right? What is the date today? Yes. There you go. Right. Today's November twelfth, and this last day is December twelfth. Okay. Thirty days from now. So not a lot of time, because then you know Thanksgiving will be here. Your family will be over. They're distracting you. Turkey's in the air. Well, my wife says she doesn't want a turkey this year. My friend Aubin used to do uh, crab legs every year. He would go and get a whole bunch of the Alaskan king crab legs or something like that. And it's like him and his family would eat crab legs. Whatever. Again, December 12th is coming up. Uh, again, you should have a title. So when you start a proposal, maybe you can use a picture logo or whatever, make it like this. Overview, you should have that written today, or we'll talk about it today. Maybe you can, when, when you have written it and turn that in, there's an assignment box. You're supposed to be typing this up and turning it in. Was it due today? Was there an assignment box? Yes. Tonight. Or maybe you can type it with me today. I can talk to you about it. We've got a whole half hour. 40 minutes, I can talk quick. Should we beat ideas against each other? 
We tried to do that last Thursday, but I think we were all in like slow motion last Thursday, right? I was in slow motion. I think you were in slow motion. We were all in kind of slow motion. I was in, I remember accreditation is coming up next week. You need to come on time on Tuesday. I'd hate the, the accreditation people to show up at my door and there's only three people in this room. I'll be sending you an email saying, come on time next Tuesday. We're going to be here. And God forbid we don't get accreditation because of Jeff. Right? The dean of fire. Research, you should have your lever screen grab. Competitive analysis, look at other people and what you need. You should be writing about design, what you like about design, what is not working. And again, you don't have to write in design words, you just write in common sense. This is not working, why? Or this is ugly, why? We don't use the word ugly, but just try and use words. Unsightly. Don't use the word beauty. Don't use the word I don't like or I like. Try to avoid that. <coughs> Describe maybe why it's not working. But try to avoid I don't like or I like. We ban that in, in meetings, design meetings. Client question list, uh, we didn't really go over that too much. We can probably cut that out if you want to. Uh, and this, this client question list, and I did list some information, is usually if you're redesigning something with a client, what are the questions you would ask somebody? We really did to cover that very much. Persona we did last week though, right? We talked a lot about persona and why is it important to have a persona? So you should have very good personas. You should think about who is interacting with what you want to design and why. Maybe it's a travel site. What, who is going to your travel site? Maybe go off of the travel site you've already made. If you're having problems getting ideas, that might be one way to go. Continue with what we did. But think about who would use it. Remember, you need three. I want three personas. Wireframe drawing, we saw that video last week. You should have at least a rough sketch of some kind of what your screen looks like. And then uh, we'll do uh, a digital wireframe today quickly. And then next class, we'll do one in a little bit more detail. Today we'll start, the next class we're actually going to make and done multiple wireframes. Okay? If we have enough time. Yes? Do it any program you want. You can use Adobe XD if you want. That's fine. I'll show you how to make a prototype out of Adobe XD if you want. Okay, again, remember the, the week after Thanksgiving, I'm going to make a prototype. You can use Sketch to make a prototype or Adobe XD. I'll demonstrate both. How about that? All it is is you're making hot spots and linking from one screen to the other, and then you can put in the transition if it slides, if it wipes, right? So if somebody touches the button and it slides to the next screen, you can say slide. And then we'll video somebody interacting with the prototype. Uh, type in color. We've got to do that this week as well. You should come up with a list of the fonts you're going to use and a color scheme. Uh, and at least three color comps. This would be like a final design. And you should have interaction. So if you have a prototype, you can go from one screen to the other to the other like three. You should have more than just three. Uh, then the uh, prototype, you make your prototype, and then you have your friend review it. And then the last thing in your proposal is mark any ideas. And there's probably get the word out about that, about your project. QR codes. Google Ads, tell a friend, write a review, Yelp review, SEO, Facebook, social media. Yeah. 
I don't know. I was typing this Saturday. I'll probably revise it, but I just wanted to get to at least you know the dates here. So this day, this week, you should have your overview, title, research, client questions, persona, and wireframe drawings this week. Next week, we'll do color and type. You should have progress before the week before Thanksgiving. You should at least show us what you've done so far so we can critique it. The week of Thanksgiving, we will make sure that you know how to make a color comp. You already know how to do that. That's why I was really stressing how to learn Photoshop and Illustrator at the beginning. And I know Sketch is a different program, and you don't have to use Sketch. You can use Photoshop and Illustrator, just like you did for the other one. But I like to demonstrate Sketch because it's a good program, and a lot of people use it. Then the week after Thanksgiving, we'll build your prototype, and then there's no class on the 10th. You just come on the 12th. So that's an overview of, uh, uh oh, did I log out of Canvas? Did I log out of Canvas? Didn't I log out of Canvas? I did. Logged out of Canvas. Okay. Where are we going to? So that was the final project. Uh, some other things. This is just a research. This is just a video. Or not a video. This is actually a website called Patterns. And so if you're making a app for a specific topic you can go there and get some ideas basically it's an idea website okay so let's say you're doing a weather app you they don't have a weather I already looked they don't have a weather <laughs> weather app but they do have um, maps maybe so they have map ideas Calendar and time. Charts. This is kind of the idea I had for weather. Heavy rain, see it? That's pretty ugly, though. So this one is called Patterns. You can look up different design ideas. You can get them from there. Um, here's a video from last semester of how I made a prototype in Photoshop. So if you want to practice your Photoshop skills, you can watch these videos. It's basically I'm going over how to use Photoshop to make a color comp. Okay. That's good practice for you. You can always use more Photoshop. Prototype ideas. Uh, this one is just a, uh, showing you how you can use Keynote. What is Keynote? Keynote is the presentation software from Apple, right? It's called Keynote. Well, Keynote has a lot of animation capabilities in Keynote. And what makes animation nice is the Android platform. So what they're trying to say here is in this video is that you can use Keynote to make a really cool Android or Android prototype, right? And they show you an example. So here it is. Oh, I forgot the music is loud. Look, oh, weather. So the top one's the original uh, Android. So again, they were showing you that, you know, you can make a really cool prototype with just the Keynote program from Apple. And it's it's following the, uh, you know, material design. So that was a link there. And then my last demonstration today, 
will be about uh, the wireframe resources. So I'd like to go over how to, to, to download some of these resources here. So there's a lot of pre-made artwork already done for you. I think we looked at some of that already in Sketch. And let me pause, stop this recording.